from New York City for our viewers worldwide. I'm Shanali Basic, and it's the last show of the year for Bloomberg Real Yields, and it starts right now. Coming up, Fed officials are pushing back against expectations for rate cuts in 2024. And the latest data points to a soft landing for the U.S. economy. It's pushing credit spreads to around two-year lows as we enter the new year. And we begin with a big issue, a Goldilocks market heading into 2024. Right now, we're really in a sweet spot. Inflation has come down rapidly. With, I think, pretty strong economic growth. The Fed's in a good spot. The soft landing opportunity has increased. The inflation data certainly support the idea that the Fed can start in, in March. Fed has really signaled that they're willing they're willing to start to ease rates. You saw some pushback. Fed speak pushback on some of the moves in the market. It's difficult when you've got the chair with a very, very dovish message and then members of the committee are walking it back. It's saying that the markets are being a bit presumptuous. The market's already well ahead of the Fed. It has been an absolutely enormous rally here. Bonds and stocks alike have trimmed the tree. They popped the champagne cork for New Year's. They booked a ticket for summer vacation. Too much easing in financial conditions could ultimately mean Inflation is stickier to come down. The message for markets is, like, don't get ahead of yourself in expecting a huge number of rate cuts in the first half of 2024. Now, today we got those PCE numbers, and when you look at a six-month annualized basis, the core metric rose 1.9%. And it's the first time in more than three years that the measure is below the Fed's 2% target. It's an amazing turnaround story for a preferred gauge of inflation for the Fed, and it is causing markets to really recalibrate their expectations in line with where they have been around the pivot story as we've seen in recent weeks. Now let's flip up the board here because that pivot story is very significant. When you think about the round trip we have seen in treasuries, that 5% mark from the 10 year, it seems so long ago. We have seen those yields just shoot high up and right back down to essentially where we've started the year. And you've seen the same across different parts of the curve. You think about the two year and the 10 year now at about three 90. Now joining us now is Robert Tipp of PGM and Barry Knapp of Ironsides Macroeconomics. And Robert, let's start with you, because when you look at this round trip we have had in such a volatile year, it begs the question, even at the short end of the curve, do you expect that kind of volatility going into 2024? I do. I think the market has entered a, a normal range, but the normal range for the market can be very wide. And as uh, soft as the data has been here with inflation the last couple months, it's been very volatile. I mean, the headline level, you look three, four months back, you had a pair of very high prints. So I think uh, next year could be a lot like this year in the sense that on average, it was very productive for bonds, uh, up, you know, 6% uh, most of the year, but now with yields dropping at the end of the year, pushing 10% for the market. But at any given point in time, it was 5% higher or lower. Uh, than the midpoint of the range. There are five uh, major moves in the market, three up, two down. I think we could see that pattern next year as the market sees a couple of good months, a couple of bad months, and uh, moves from one extreme to the other. I want to read you both something from earlier. Philadelphia Fed President Patrick Harker had weighed in on rate cuts. He said it's important that we start to move rates down. We don't have to do it too fast. <clears throat> We're not going to do it right away. Yet, Barry, you see the market recalibrating oh so quickly, expecting rates to be cut as early as March. Do you think that the market's going to be disappointed? Yeah, at the expense of sounding like a curmudgeon, um, I, I do... And my view, even prior to that surprising December pivot, was that the Fed absolutely needed to disinvert the yield curve in the first half of 2024 to be able to absorb government supply, the multifamily real estate units that were under construction that would be completed and need to be refinanced, high yield, just a range of issuance in the first half of the year. Um, but they had added what I would consider I, I, the way I was framing the Fed policy reaction function after the September meeting was disinflation was the necessary condition for them to ease policy. But the sufficient condition was additional labor market slack and unemployment rate through 4 percent would be a great manifestation of that it sort of changed the rules in December. So, yes, I do believe they'll begin in March. However, they probably need the policy rate 
to go all the way down to 4% to really start to loosen the bank credit channel. And I'm not sure the inflation numbers are going to be that cooperative. They are leaning very heavily right now on core goods disinflation. Over the last six months in the CPI measure, they're falling at a 2.5% annualized rate. That's as deep as the goods deflation that occurred in the early 2000s when China's market share of global trade was ramping up. So I doubt that will persist. Things like the problems in the Red Sea are a case against that. So I think we are headed for a little bit of a, um, a crack up here between the six cuts the market thinks we're going to get and the three that the Fed thinks they're going to deliver. What do you think, Robert? If you think about what the Fed is expecting and what the market is expecting, where is the disconnect most pronounced? Right. Well, the markets have gone to extremes. There's no doubt about that. But on the inflation side, I mean, it's worth keeping in mind that a lot of prices are up spectacularly over the last few years. And when that happens, it's very unusual that it does. But in the aftermath, it's not difficult to have prices come down in a number of categories, and that can depress the overall average. The other thing to keep in mind is the significance of housing. And we've had a bizarre situation where the increase in rates crimped the supply of existing homes coming into the market. And there was a lag on the multifamily supply coming onto the market. And so we've had pretty firm rent inflation coming through the CPI. But now that supply is coming in, rates are down. That may loosen up some of the uh, existing home sale uh, market. And so some of the rent data is coming in distinctly soft. So there are a lot of things that could keep the disinflation story on track. The Fed has been unstable. In July, they really went with that story that we could cut as inflation comes down to avoid being too tight. They abandoned that in September. They re-embraced it in December. I would guess, you know, the two out of three, I would go with that. So I think the scope is going to be for, there for them to cut, whether the inflation numbers are cooperative enough for them to deliver basically 200 basis points. I mean, that's what it's going to take to keep the markets uh, happy, um, you know, is an open question. Um, but I wouldn't rule it out, number one. And number two, the market pricing is not just looking at a base case. It's looking at the fact that higher rates uh, are less likely because the Fed, mm -hmm. uh, you know, is near the peak and that much lower rates cannot be ruled out if there's a slowdown in the economy. Okay, so, so there's some nuance here in what you're saying, what Barry's saying. And if Barry, if you believe that maybe not higher for longer uh, as much as we had thought before, but still uh, somewhat higher for somewhat longer, the, begs the question, in your view then, what are the lag defense effects that are still to be felt? Yeah, I think um, I really liked Robert's characterization of that, particularly the end being an old derivatives guy. If the you know skew is leaning towards potentially having weaker growth or disinflation, meaning we could get more rate cuts versus very little probability that we get higher rate cuts, that would move that skew down. So that was a great point. Um, yeah, I mean, I, there are some still some lingering risks. I, I, I agree with Robert that Housing inflation is going to put downward pressure on CPI through at least March, which is integral in my forecast that they will cut in, in March. Um, and as I intimated, you know, we still have this big supply of multifamily units under construction, some million units that were, were financed as construction loans. But when those are completed, they have to be refinanced as multifamily loans. The small banking system owns that those liabilities. Uh, or their assets for the banks, but they will have to refinance it. And right now the bank credit is contracting at a, at a rate that it's only contracted more than one time in the last 50 years. And that was during mm -hmm. the uh, global financial crisis. So is that, that's why I mentioned that bank credit channel, there's still room for right. a bit of a crack up there. You know, um, speaking of so the that economy, to me is one of those risks that right. could skew it. Negatively. I want you both to hear this too. We spoke earlier to Lael Brainard, U.S. Economic Council director and former vi Fed vice chair, because she was looking back at where we started the year and where we are now. Let's just take a quick listen. If you look back over the course of the year, it is really stunning how much progress uh, the economy has made. Inflation's come down faster than even the more optimistic forecasts. 
and growth has remained very resilient uh, along with a strong employment. If you recall a year ago, the consensus projection was that getting inflation down would require a spike in unemployment and a recession. To both of you, starting with Robert here, do we get through this cycle without a recession? Yeah, I think so. I think that what we've seen over the past year is that this expansion is pretty resilient to the high interest rates, uh, has a lot more going for it. I think one aspect of that uh, in DM economies has been high immigration, uh, has uh, boosted growth, but I think just intrinsic growth has, has been very firm. Uh, so I think uh, this moderating environment has been uh, super for the bond market on average. I think it's going to be very uh, dangerous for individuals, but uh, tremendous for professional investors in that, you know, one day individuals are going to wake up and cash rates will have been cut uh, if and as the Fed stays on their path, which three to five years from now would have them back at two and a half percent. Cash will be trash uh, and uh, it will be critical for investors to be in the bond market, which is the only market that's really revalued here. Uh, professional investors, on the other hand, are going to have a, a great time with this, I think, and that around that base case of moderating economic growth and moderating inflation, we're going to see these big ranges for economic expectations, and that's going to result in big trading ranges. How hard is the slowdown, Barry? Do we make it through without a recession? So I've been characterizing the economy as in an unstable equilibrium for some six months now. And a year ago, I didn't think we were going in recession. And where I'm going with that unstable equilibrium uh, you know, label is that if you look just at duration of bond indices as a manifestation of this, the large non-financial corporate sector has extended duration at some seven years. They're not particularly sensitive to higher rates. You could look at the mortgage ind index as a manifestation of what the household sensitivity is to higher rates. They've turned out their mortgage debt. You know, the effective mortgage rate is below four. So those two sectors are not particularly vulnerable, but the duration of the high yield index is falling. I saw a note from a former colleague, Eric Felder, today about of the trillion of issuance of high yield over the last several years, only 18 percent was fixed rate. So highly leveraged companies are sensitive. Small banks are sensitive to the deeply inverted yield curve, the deepest inversion since the Volcker regime, which wiped out the savings and loan industry eventually. Um, small businesses have primarily floating rate debt. So they're sensitive to this. And we don't have really good data on small business, including small business employment. So I think there's parts of the economy that are struggling with this. I don't believe the NBER will declare this to have been a recession, even if the employment unemployment rate goes through four. Um, we will muddle through. But there are parts of the economy that are struggling mightily with the deeply inverted curve and the very aggressive rate policy. Still inverted. Robert Tip, Barry Knapp, sticking with us. Up next, we're going to talk about the trade with them. And up next, we have the auction block. We're going to highlight the year end for issuance as credit investors look ahead to 2024. This is Real Yield on Bloomberg. I'm Shanali Basic, and this is Bloomberg Real Yield. It's time now for the auction block, where issuance, for the most part, and as expected, stalled to close the year. So we're going to look at some numbers for the year end. When it comes to high-grade dealers, Bank of America sold the most bonds by volume, while J.P. Morgan issued the most by the number of deals. Citigroup, Morgan Stanley, Wells Fargo, and Goldman are among the top group. December supply is expected to finish at around $23 billion. And looking at the cost to borrow, U.S. high-grade spreads hit their lowest level since early 2022. This comes after a year that saw the spreads jump to 1.63 in March, a level rarely seen over the last five years. Investors were fearful of how rate hikes would hurt companies, but those concerns have mostly dissipated. And over in high yields, the rally powered by the Fed's rate decisions pulled borrowers into the market to capitalize on a risk-on type of mood. Year-to-date volume is up around $176 billion, up 73% year over year, but it still trails what we saw in the years prior. And when it comes to high yields, Invesco's Matt Brill lays out his outlook for next year. 
I think the high yield double B market looks very good. The triple B market, the fundamentals are very, very sound. And so overall, I, I think you can go down. I think if you look, still the triple C sector is, is challenged. I think there's, there's there, it's, 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 had, it's had very good returns, but there are some landmines there. So overall, you know, I just think that there's, there's a lot of good opportunities. Now, still with us is P. Jim's Robert Tip and Barry Knapp of Ironside's Macroeconomic. So Robert, if you think about the types of risk you can take on in fixed income, say next year is the year for fixed income, finally, again, do you take on duration risk at that point or credit risk? Yeah, I think duration is going to be a tactical game. I mean, strategically, you're in the value zone for bonds. Uh, but like I said about this year, around that base case return, we were a handful of percentage points above or below that. So I think there will be a tactical field day in the duration realm again next year. I think on the credit side, it's likely to be a positive year, but not as positive as 2023. 2023 started off with spreads at a terrific value point. Uh, now we're starting off at, at a tight level. Uh, this is going to require a, a fine-tooth comb to make sure you're avoiding the problems. Uh, there will be rising defaults. It's going to be important uh, for investors, uh, especially in certain sectors like uh, levered finance, uh, the floating rate borrowers that were less sophisticated, smaller capital structures will have problems. Those will have knock-on impacts for structured products like CLOs. be very important to... Uh, know your individual issuer risk in those kind of layered structures. Uh, I think also in commercial mortgage backs, the office space uh, may have some opportunities, but there's definitely a lot of risk there. And then there'll be a lot of differentiation, even in the vanilla sectors like investment grade corporate. So mm -hmm. on balance, these moderating economic environment, moderating growth, moderating inflation, economic environments are very positive for credit. Uh, valuations do have room to move on average, but it's going to require uh, you know more discrimination among the individual issuers this year than say uh, the coming year 2024 than in 2023. After all, it's the job of a credit investor not to lose money. And Barry, if you look at the areas next year that could still be choppy, that could still lead to defaults. Where do you start to avoid? Well. Um I mentioned um, multifamily real estate, commercial real estate a little bit earlier. Um, the, uh, I'll, I'll move on, if I may, to stuff that I like, which is I, I, all my comments have implicitly been negative bank equities, right? If we have this deeply inverted curve, the banking sector is uh, contracting in terms of assets, shrinking the bank equity, and we have this big regulatory overhang. We actually have what looks like a pretty good battle royale going on within the Fed where uh, Michelle Bowman is against the capital uh, suggestions, the Basel end game, the CRA requirements, the um, additional countercyclical um, buffer that they want to put on the big uh, GSIB banks, but Barr is all in on it. So in that environment where we've got this capital overhang, bank equity is unattractive, but the credit part of the capital structure uh, would look much more attractive. Things like bank prefs should perform pretty well, particularly in an environment where you're going to ask them to have even less leverage and less credit risk. Clearly, we're pushing that risk out to the non-bank sector if these proposals go through, but that notwithstanding, the bank uh, part of the credit capital structure should be pretty good. And I, I, we're talking about credit specifically, but I like the mortgage market uh, quite a bit as well. If the curve does disinvert, if the Fed cuts enough to get that curve to disinvert, most of the buyers for mortgages are leveraged one way or another, REITs, banks, so on and so forth. That could improve demand there and tighten those mortgage spreads. So mortgages over credit is, is one of my you know, favorite macro trades. It's interesting. To the extent, Robert, you're willing to take on a little bit of credit risk, where do high yield spreads really need to be to provide an attractive entry point? Right. Well, I think that high yield is likely to have positive excess return. It's likely to outperform governments this coming year. Uh, and I think that's going to be true for most of the credit sectors. But I think the uh, counterintuitive point here is that it will do so in the face of rising defaults. Um, but a lot of those levered finance defaults, I think, will be coming from the smaller companies, 
Uh, it'll be coming from those that have uh, excessive exposure, exposure to floating rate uh, financing as opposed to fixed rate. I think a lot of the companies that made it through COVID uh, have consolidated uh, in their industries. They tend to be larger players, more sophisticated, have turned out their capital structures. The issuance that's come to the fixed coupon high yield market has tended to be higher quality, whereas to the floating rate loan market has been lower quality. So the quality of that market is quite high. Another feature going for the high yield markets and as well for the muni market uh, is the fact that compared to other markets, the supply is quite limited. And for high yield, actually, uh, there's a net shrinking uh, aspect to the market uh, that all else equal keeps the supply uh, quite limited there. So I think high yield is likely to be uh, a solid performer, despite the fact that we're starting off with spreads, uh, not at particularly high levels from a historical perspective. Complicated times. Robert Tipp and Barry Knapp, we thank you both so much for your time and wish you a very, very, very happy holiday. Still ahead, the final spread, the week ahead, the final data points of the year. This is Real Yield on Bloomberg. I'm Shanali Basak, and this is Bloomberg Real Yield. It's time now for the final spread, the week ahead, coming up in the final week of the year. Monday, remember, U.S. markets are closed for Christmas holiday. Tuesday, we have Boxing Day holiday in some countries. And we'll get a read on the housing market with the S&P CoreLogic Case Shiller Index. We are not done with that economic data yet. Thursday is another round of jobless claims looking for further signs of cooling in that labor market. And for my final thought, Really, this is the last show of the year for Bloomberg Real Yield. It has been a round trip in yields as we've been talking about, and it's setting up for another volatile year ahead. I hope you'll write to me, and I hope that you will watch the show every Friday next year as we watch for whether rate cuts will meet the market as investors expect it. Happy holidays, everyone, and have a happy, happy new year from New York. That does it from us. This is Bloomberg Real Yield for 2023, and this is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.